the Black Swan wanted to show that it was good music, it was on a higher level, and they did a lot of um, innovative things in terms of the recording and bringing people in. They had people, artists signed like, uh, you probably heard of, everybody heard of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom? Well, Ma Rainey was with Black Swan Records for a while. They had a woman called Alberta Hunter, who's very popular and, and, and uh, had a renaissance in like the 70s and 80s. She played at the cookery in, in Greenwich Village for about 10 years. Every would be still sold out every night. People would hear do her blues songs from that time period. And Louis Armstrong came there to record with some people. But this is a, an original Black Swan record label that you're looking. Um, and they would promote their records by trying to, to get um, people in the African-American community to buy it and, and tell you that they were the original, it, it was a promotional type of thing, but these are some of the original, these are some of the original uh, ads that they used. And I'm about to show you what happened after Ethel Waters became popular. If you can look back at a sort of a transition in history of uh, African-American women, you can go, the, I would say the last blues singer, true blues singer would be Aretha Franklin. And before Aretha Franklin, you'd have Dinah Washington. And then before that, you'd have Billie Holiday. And then Ella Fitzgerald, okay? And then Bessie Smith. And then if you wanna go back, the beginning and the roots of that is Ethel Waters. Because when she sells that amount of uh, units of music, it becomes aware to most of the music companies that if they wanna make money, this is where they needed to go. But something happened. They realized that, um, how can I put this? If you're looking at America at a time when things are very segregated, they wanted to, they, they began to segregate the music as, as if the music notes know that somebody's one ethnic group or another, they did it, okay? And it, it created a, the music industry that we know even up to today. It, it's been changed somewhat, but not exactly. But this is the roots of it. So what happens is Ethel Waters becomes sort of a, um, a prototype for the blues singer. Most of us think of blues singers as B.B. King with the guitar. No, it's this woman with this, this massive voice dressed in these gowns and these feathers like Bessie Smith, that's packing them in. And so everybody wants to have an Ethel Waters or a Bessie Smith or an Alberta Hunter. So the big record companies, after they see the sale, they develop a, a, a section of their record company that's known as Race Records, okay? This might, this might scare some of you, but the fact and the truth of it is the name doesn't change until maybe 1948 when they changed it from race records to rhythm and blues. And that's because Jerry Wexler at Atlantic Records says, that's not a good idea to call it that. It's not fair. Let's call it what it is. It's rhythm and it's blues. But uh, I've seen records by jazz artists like Duke Ellington or Louis Armstrong that says race records on the label. Okay, part of our uh, heritage and history. These are the types of ads they would put in major papers to try to sell. <laughs> if I don't have this, I don't have, it says what it is, what it is, okay? Um, oh, look at the drawings. It is what it is. These are the original drawings that major record companies would put in magazines and newspapers to sell their blues records, okay? This is our, our great Ethel Waters. And when, the, when that record, uh, Down Home Blues becomes so popular, she goes on a tour of the United States and, and mainly in the South. And practically everywhere she goes, it sells out. And guess what? People that are buying her records are not just black people. She's very popular with, with the white audience too, which is something you're gonna see later on down the line with other uh, popular African-American performers. People like music, they like good music and they don't really care who's doing it, okay? So Ethel's tour, so this sets a precedence for what's going to happen. She took she took the the jazz band with her. They traveled on trains, and and as they would go to different cities, either they were promoting the the concert that was coming, or uh, it would get a very nice write up. So by the time she finished with that tour, they were on the way. So there's another picture of of uh, uh, Ethel Wood is being promoted by um, Black Swan Records, and to make us. Make a statement about Ethel Waters. She it wound up having a career that lasted something like fifty years and a phenomenal performer in the sense that the first television show that was made in 1939 featured Ethel Waters. 
At one time, she was the highest paid performer on Broadway. Uh, she did the movie Pinky and she got nominated for an Academy Award in the 40s for that. And in the early 50s, she did Member of the Wedding and got an Oscar nomination. She won a, 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 a Drama Critics Award. She won an Emmy. He did a, a, a television show. And she, in her later years, as an older woman, she became associated with Billy Graham's Crusades and she sang with him. So she had a very full career and she never, she, to look back on it, very few people have accomplished what she did in that amount of time. She always complained that she could never get her hands on her money though. There's some more advertisements for Ethel Waters. Look at the names of the songs. I ain't gonna marry us and settle down brown baby. Memphis man, midnight blues. I'm telling you Memphis must be something else after dark. Okay, so what happened, uh, uh, why did Black Swan Records go out of business in 1923? Well, one thing they did that, that Barry Gordy did was in 1922, they actually bought a plant and they produced their own records. So they owned the means of production, they had a factory. What kind of really uh, sunk them and killed them, not just the fact that the major companies were now uh, trying to get blues artists and race records, as they call them. But the new, the new invention that came along that changed uh, th the game was a thing called the radio. Once the radio came popular, a lot of people didn't buy what anymore? Records. So uh, Black Swan was a struggling company anyway. Uh, they were making their, their, their payroll and everything. But as a result of that, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, make it any, any longer. And Harry Pace Jr. then sold his company uh, to Paramount, okay? Which is gonna be similar to what Barry Gordy Jr. is gonna do. Now remember, you're saying, well, how could the radio make a big change? Well, guess what? When television comes along in the 50s, radio uh, uh, sank, it, you know, okay? And when we started having um, cable TV, uh, a lot of movie theaters were worried about going out of business, right? I don't go to the movies anymore. <laughs> okay, so uh, technology does uh, play a lot part in the success or failure of a certain type of business. You gotta keep up with the trend, all right? Um, so when Harry Pace Jr. sold his a company, he goes to Chicago and as a businessman, he actually opens up a big mutual insurance company, which becomes one of the largest African-American insurance companies in the United States. And he still becomes a millionaire. And one of the people that worked for him was a, a young man called John H. Johnson. And uh, that gentleman asked him, what should he do? He wanted to start a, a, a magazine business for African-Americans because the majors like Life and Look didn't really cover uh, our, our main artists like Louis Armstrong. So he said, well, go ahead and try it. You know, you, you can't fail. It's not what you uh, do. Do not love what you, do not let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. So Johnson borrowed money from his mother. Uh, I think they put a, a <laughs> they pawned their furniture to get the money for the loan to start the business, and that business became Ebony Magazine. Ebony Magazine is still around today. Life Magazine is gone. Look Magazine is gone, but Ebony Magazine is still around today. So that's just a small story. So we said that. <clears throat> Our biggest story for today is gonna to be the Motown story. So is everybody ready? Okay. One of the first songs that Motown had as a hit was written by Barry Gordy. And I'll give you two seconds of it because you know we were supposed to do the show live here anyway, but perhaps next year this time, we'll, at some point we will. Here we go, everybody ready? The best things in life are free. But you can give them to the birds and bees. I want money. That's what I want. I want money. That's what I want. That's what I want. And guess what? Barry Gordy got it. Detroit, Michigan. How many of you have been to Detroit? Okay. The Motor City. Well, guess what? This is a picture of Motown in like maybe the late 50s. And you see it's industrialized. And when my students at St. Rose learned about it, I wanted them to understand that you can't connect the Supremes and Stevie Wonder and the Four Tops 
to Detroit without understanding the great migration. Because if all of you out there know, Detroit is famous for what? That's right, automobiles. It's where in America, they made the cars. And the thing that happened that attracted a lot of African-American people there for work was that they would actually hire them. And guess what? They also would put them in the unions. So coming to Detroit meant that you could possibly get a job in the automobile industry. And the research I did, there was a minister in the African-American community that had connections with Ford and would help you get a job with the car industry. So if I'm not mistaken, I was told in the United States during that time period, the, the one area that had a really good middle class was Detroit because people didn't have to have a, a great education to be able to work in an automobile plant. You learn that particular assembly line thing and you're on your way. Why am I saying this? Because a lot of the, the artists that you're gonna find out in Motown, their families did work in the automobile industry. Guess who else worked at the automobile industry for a while? Barry Gordy. And Barry Gordy's family uh, came from Georgia. And his father was a farmer, his mother was a teacher. And what happened is the father had sold a lot of his crops and made a lot of money. And he was scared that the Ku Klux Klan in the area was gonna try to, uh, to, because of jealousy, was gonna try to hurt him. So he snuck out of, of that area of Georgia, uh, Georgia and brought his family to Detroit because he had a brother there. His father, um, Barry Gordy Sr. was a businessman. He eventually had two businesses, a plastering business in Detroit and a printing business, which the children all worked in. So from a very young age, um, Barry's middle-class upbringing made him aware of what you could do as far as business. His family had their own little credit union where they put money in. And if somebody needed something, um, they would be apply for a loan just like a bank and they would loan it to them with interest and they'd have to pay it back. And so one of the things that happened is Barry was the next to the youngest and he was kind of, a, a psychologists would call him a late bloomer because he tried a lot of things and he knew how to play the piano. He liked, uh, he was in the military, um, in the army during the Korean war. He owned a record store that, that didn't work because people, he wanted to sell jazz and people wanted blues. His sisters worked at a nightclub in Detroit that had all the biggest entertainers. And Barry had begun, he doesn't begin trying to have a record company. He's a songwriter. And the reason I'm, the reason I'm mentioning this is because like Harry Pace Jr., he had an idea how the music business operated, especially the publishing. So he was successful in getting Jackie Wilson, who was a Detroit native uh, and a very popular R&B singer at that time with a lot of hits. Barry Gordy wrote about four or five of his biggest hit records. Then he found out that to collect the money uh, that was owed to him for royalties was almost virtually impossible. And uh, a lawyer told him that it would cost him more money to sue the companies to get his money than, uh, th than he would get anyway. So he was talking about that with Smokey Robinson. I'll get to that story in a minute. His song, let's back up a little bit. His song read, writing led him to, to be in an office at the time when um, the Matadors, uh, a group of kids who wanted to be signed with Jackie Wilson's company. And this young man that came in had a bunch of songs and, and they didn't want him. They thought he was the right type. You know, you got a girl group, we don't want that. And Barry says, you got more songs like that? And then Smokey said, yes, about a hundred more. And so he said, okay, let's do this. Uh, I'll sign you to work for me and we'll, we'll get something going. And they did, they began their, their partnership at that point. Fast forward, they made a record and they were trying to collect uh, the royalties on it and they were having a hard time. And so Smokey suggested to uh, Barry, as the story goes, that he should find, form his own company and become the one in charge and you don't have to worry about that. So with his background and knowledge of the music business, Barry Gordy went forward to his brothers and sisters, mother and father, sat down at a table one night and asked for the $800 he needed to start what was known as Motown Tamala. And guess what? They said yes, okay? And the hits just kept right on coming. What you're looking at is uh, in, in Detroit, Hitsville, as I said, Barry Gordy Jr. and uh, Harry Pace Jr. had a lot of similarities. 
Barry Gordy Jr. bought a house on West Grand Boulevard. Today, it's the Motown Museum. It would become Hitsville. Barry lived upstairs and downstairs on the first floor and in the basement was where they recorded some of the best songs that have ever been written in the history of music, okay? So today it's still there. And if you go to Detroit, I, I, I beg you to go to the Motown Museum because it has a lot of memorabilia and it's fixed up. So that would be Barry Gordy Jr. who's about in his nineties uh, nowadays, hanging in there, all right? That's Hitsville, USA. And a few of the little details, uh, facts and trivia. Gordy borrowed $800 from his father in 1959 to start the Motown. He then released Marv Johnson's songs, Come To Me. And Motown found a Barry Gordy as a producer and songwriter. And his first group and first million, million selling act was The Miracles. Anybody know what song it was? 10, 9, 8. My mama told me, you better what? Shop around. Oh yeah, you better shop around. Gotcha. Gordy wrote and co-wrote over 200 songs for Motown's music catalog, consisting of approximately 15,000 songs. And Motown was the first record label to run its own charm school to teach its artists how to perform. Oh yeah, they, they were groomed. Uh, if you see these pictures of the Supremes and they're standing outside, you'll notice that they have a special where the right foot is in front of the left foot. The lady taught them deportment and, and, and how to sit down and get up and uh, which fork goes here. It was important because she said that she was preparing them to, prepare, to perform before kings and queens. And one day they would. Um, the backing band, which is very important. We said that um, Harry Pace Jr. had a good house band. Barry Gordy Jr. already knew a lot of musicians in Detroit, remember? And he got a lot of jazz musicians and hired them by the session. Now, here's what I need you to understand. He hired a lot of uh, African-American musicians, but he also hired a lot of white musicians. And it's very important that you know this because we think of, 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 of Motown as, as you know, an African-American sound, but all throughout there were um, white musicians, arrangers, managers, people that are doing marketing. And a lot of the songs like My, My Girl, if you take away the rhythm section, they would bring in the Detroit Symphony Orchestra to do those string things during, during the, uh, um, the break. Okay, the bridge, I'm sorry, that's what they, the musical term. So the backing band, uh, which actually, the Funk Brothers actually came here for uh, Tula Festival, I got to meet them, um, were great. Uh, the, there's only a couple of them that are still surviving, but they played on most of the big hits, you know, which is important. And in between 1961 and 1971, Motown produced 110 US top 10 hits. Try it again, 110 top 10 hits. And Motown derives its name from Motor City, the nickname for Detroit where the label was founded. And it's, we know that's because of the home of the cars. So not to bore you, we're gonna get into some of the acts. We said the first act, that I'm, I'm, the pictures that you're going to see today are of the artists between uh, 61 and about 63, because the golden, that's the golden years where uh, I should say the, the British invasion begins about 1964, but the British invasion is influenced by Motown. The Beatles' first album, Meet the Beatles, has Please Mr. Postman, you really got a hold on me and money. So they were influenced by Motown also, as well as a lot of other artists. But the Miracles were the first group that Barry Gordy signed. And of course, with the Miracles, you have a miracle in Smokey Robinson, who not only can sing like, like nobody else can, but he also writes songs that became the biggest hits of, of Motown. Uh, songs like My Guy, My Girl, the tracks of my tears. Okay, everybody out there singing, ooh, baby, baby. Okay, yeah, and, and cruising more, more, more down the line, okay? So I got an opportunity to see the Miracles in 1965 in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, they were the headliners then. And when they did their farewell show in Madison Square Garden when I was in high school in 1972, yeah, they were still going strong. 
they did a wonderful uh, show with the Four Tops and Junior Walker and the All Stars and a group called, new group called LaBelle, Patty LaBelle and the Blue Bell. Okay, next. Who's your favorite? The Miracles. After this, you can tell me. Uh oh, <clears throat> the Prince of Motown. All the ladies out there screaming and hollering now, right? One of Motown's largest selling uh, songs, records of all time, was Marvin Gaye's What Song? Ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. It was called I Heard It Through the Grapevine. Woo! Marvin Gaye had a few facts. He's from Washington, D.C. He went to Chicago. He was part of the uh, the group that sings uh, the, the Ten Commandments of Love. And he came to Chicago with Harvey Fuqua and signed on as a drummer. He so played on songs like Please Mr. Postman and, and Beach and Beachwood. And most people don't know Marvin wrote Dancing in the Streets, the song that Martha and Vandels are famous for. And he was going to do it, but he said, let Martha do it. Because Martha and the Vandels were his background singers when he be, begins to get his first song. But that's Marvin Gaye, the Prince of Motown. And in addition, at that time period, later on, we know he's going to change with the beard and what's going on. But this is Marvin during that time period. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I saw Marvin Gaye in 1965 at that Brooklyn Fox show. And what was his song? I still remember. I can never forget it. Um, you do me wrong and still I'm crazy about you. Ain't that peculiar? And that song was written by who else? Smokey Robinson. Okay. The Marvelous Marvelettes. I love these ladies. I love these ladies. They were Motown's first girl group to get like a number one record. Does anybody know what that record was? It's been recorded by the Carpenters. It's been recorded by a whole lot of people. She's raising her hand. I see out there. Guess what? If you go to the, uh, uh, the corner, there's always uh, somebody you're looking for. And you say, what girls? Oh, yeah. Wait a minute, mister. Yay, 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 mister. Mr. Postman, look and see. Oh, yeah. So that was the first one. They're from Inkster, Michigan, which is right next to Detroit. And there's a car factory out there. And there's an African-American community out there where these young ladies are from. Uh, their, their families came up from the South to work in the car industry. And uh, where the car industry was, they didn't want them living in that town. So they started their own black community, Inkster, Michigan. And they had quite a few hit records. Smokey Robinson then re realized that not only one of them could sing leads, he chose a little short one, Wanda Rogers, and he wrote a song about himself called, Don't Mess With Bill. No, 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 no. Don't Mess With Bill. Big hit for them. Love the Marvelettes. And yes, the Marvelettes were on that Brooklyn Fox show. I saw them. And um, I think Wanda's still around. A lot of the other ones are not, but the, the Marvelettes are one of my favorite groups. And they were Motown's first before the Supremes. We're talking 61. They had that big hit. Oh, yes. My girls. <laughs> uh, at the time period when Heat Wave came out, it was hilarious. It was one of the best songs uh, to dance to. Very popular uh, in New York City. Uh, I'm pretty sure California, L.A., and um, they, and there's a story I read that Martha said that they were uh, uh, performing at the Apollo and had to come back overnight to record this album. <laughs> so they recorded it overnight and then flew back to New York to the, 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 the next day to the Apollo Theater to, to finish their, their set. Now we have um, Martha and the other young ladies. Martha Reeves, uh, 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 I've met her. She came here to the Tulip Festival must have been about five or six years ago. It was raining dogs and cats, and they still had her sing at the uh, the lake house. And we took a picture together, and she signed an autograph. And I told her, Martha, I saw you in 1965 at that Brooklyn Fox show. I've seen Martha and the Vandellas at the Apollo Theater, and Martha and the Vandellas came to Live at Five a couple years ago. I love Martha and the Vandellas, and everybody, let's sing along. You ready? Calling out around the world, are you ready for a brand new beat? Summer's here and the time is right for what? Dance center in the streets. So Martha's still going strong. 
If you watch the movie, Good Morning America, it opens with Heat Wave. Um, they use a lot of the Motown songs in a lot of movies, they come up um, and um, it really worked well, okay? So Martha was the second uh, Motown girl group to come along that hit it big. They had a lot of hits, Dancing in the Street, Heat Wave, uh, and of course, Jimmy Mac. Jimmy Mac was written around this time, but they didn't release it for a couple of years, but there they are and they're still, and Martha, yeah, they're still performing. Ah, everybody knows this guy. I got this picture because he doesn't have braids, he doesn't have a beard, and he is actually little Stevie Wonder. His story is a miracle story too because they said that they heard about him in Detroit. Um, his family had come up from Mississippi and um, I think what something happened in the hospital where he got too much oxygen or, or too little, too, too much, I believe it was, and it caused the blindness. And he, from very young age, by, by being taken to church, and it was one of those holiness churches where they shout and scream and make a lot of noise. Stevie picked up the, uh, the, the, the sound of the music and they said, before you knew it, he was like a, a, a phenomenon. He, could, could, he was conducting the choir. He could sing and do everything else. When they brought him to Motown, he's gonna get one of Motown's next number one records, which is Fingertips. And it happens by accident um, that th that particular record becomes number one because uh, they had actually decided to um, finish the song and the, the, the audience wouldn't let him go off. So um, he, they continued and he was like, just a clap your hands, just a little bit of love. Just a little bit louder. You know, Stevie. And he went on to, to become a success and um, a very good songwriter. In addition to that, he really bloomed into the 70s. You know, he was Motown's moneymaker with uh, the double albums and um, getting the Martin Luther King holiday. But the thing about um, Stevie Wonder that was what a lot of people don't know is there was a point where he couldn't get a hit record because his voice was changing. And um, they needed a producer that wanted to work with him because they were ready to sign the papers to let him go. And this one lady, Sylvia Moyd, says, I'll work with him. And there was a song called Uptight. And they were supposed to transcribe the song in Braille. And they forgot to. And she had to actually get on the um, earphones with him and say the words before he would say, baby. Everything is all right, uptight, out of sight. And guess what? It became a hit and it saved his career. So um, there's all these little backstories I thought I'd, I'd give you. But Stevie Wonder is, is a phenomenon. Yes, I got to see Stevie Wonder. He came to Brooklyn. And probably one of my favorite songs was um, Blowing in the Wind. Yes, I still like his version of Blowing in the Wind. Next. Uh-oh, almost. These, these guys, you can't forget, the wonderful Four Tops. And uh, this gentleman here would be Levi Stubbs, the second from the, the right. And he had a phenomenal voice. Um, Martha Reeves referred to him as a, her Pavarotti. Yes, I got to see the Four Tops at that show. And they were singing, Baby, I Need Your Love. And that was just the beginning of their career because after that, I Can't Help Myself came out, right? and Reach Out, I'll Be There, and all those other songs that we know were very popular about the Four Tops. I know we got some Four Tops fans out there, so let's do this. The guy that wrote the song said that his grandpa had, um, uh, his grandma had a barbershop, excuse me, a beauty parlor, and all the ladies would come in there, and the barbershop, beauty parlor was next to their house, and he used to joke with the ladies as they were coming in, and he said, how you doing today, sugar pie? How you doing, honey bunch? So the guy that was writing the song, he was trying to get an intro. He had the melody. He said he remembered his grandfather used to, to get the women's attention by saying, how you doing, honey bun? How you doing, sugar pie? How you doing, honey bunch? So then it becomes what? Sugar pie, honey bunch. You know that I love you. I can't help myself. Yes, I got to see the Four Tops in that show in 1965. They were the opening act because they were just really starting out with Motown, but they weren't going to be opening out for long. I got to see them again uh, with Smokey Robinson in Madison Square Garden at the Farewell Tour. 
uh, they did a version of MacArthur's Park that would bring tears to your eyes. This guy had a phenomenal voice. And um, I saw them once again, uh, every year in New York City, the Temptations, this would be like 78. No, 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 not 78. This would be about eight, yeah, 80, 88. The Temptations and the Four Tops every Thanksgiving weekend, the Friday after Thanksgiving through that Sunday, they would come to Westbury and they would do a show. And at a certain point they would battle. The Temptations would do the Four Top songs uh, and the, the Four Tops would do the Temptations song. So the Temptations would do My Girl and, and the Four Tops, excuse me, Temptations would do um, I Can't Help Myself and the Four Tops would do My Girl. They'd be battling and the audience loved it. They really loved it. So they toured together for a while. Um, and so um, I really love the Four Tops. Thank you. These guys, um, what can I tell you? Uh, if you want to talk about singers, as Smokey described, the original Temptations, they were Melvin Franklin, uh, David Ruffin, Otis Williams, Paul Williams, and Eddie Kendrick. And this is when they're in their prime in like 60, 65, 67. Yeah, in their prime. And as you see, they're impeccably dressed. Like, you know, they just stepped off the cover of GQ here. And they had the most phenomenal um, uh, a cho a choreographed steps to each one of their songs. You, you wouldn't believe it. In addition, um, they they had a, one group that had how many different voc a lead vocalists? They had David Ruffin with the hits. The, and they had Eddie Kendricks. And they had Paul Williams. And then you had uh, uh, Melvin Franklin, who had the deep, the deepest bass in the world. Uh, I'll tell you the story about uh, Melvin Franklin in a minute. But Smokey Robinson was writing their songs in the beginning when he got the hit on them. And they were using Eddie's voice because he had the high tenor. Smokey said, The Temptations, you had Eddie Kendricks way up on the top. And David in the middle coming through. And way down on the bottom, you had Melvin Franklin with that bass. So he said he could do something with them musically. So the song that he did for them that got them off the ground was this. Come on, guys and girls. You got a smile so bright. You know you could have been a candle. I'm holding you so tight. Well, you could have been anything that you wanted to. And I could tell the way you do the things you do. Okay, so that was fun. Then Smokey got them into uh, the Apollo Theater backstage and he said, um, I got David here and I got a song I want him to do. And that would be the change in the game. Ready, ladies and gentlemen? I've got sunshine on a cloudy day. I guess you say what can make me feel this way. Go ahead, everybody. All right, you know the song. Smokey wrote that for them. And so they went on to, to, to do the best that they could do uh, with all of those great songs. And, and, and remember, Smokey's got his own group that's performing and he's writing songs for other people. So the Tempting Temptations, yes, I saw them in that 65 show. Um, I saw the Temptations at the Apollo Theater when they had Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Um, I saw the Temptations in Toronto. That's where I got to meet them. That's the story I was supposed to tell you. They asked me, anybody would come on stage and sing with them. They didn't have to ask me twice uh, to sing My Girl with them. And the gentleman with the deep voice, Melvin Franklin, uh, the nicest person in the world, when they came to Westbury, me and my grandfather went to see them. And I went backstage and I expected the Temptations to be running around in tuxedos. Uh, no, they had on uh, jogging suits, velour jogging suits, monogrammed with their name on it. He gave me an autograph picture uh, and a CD, and very nice, very nice, which I kept in my house for quite a while. So the Temptations forever. Oh, by the way, they came up here to uh, our 4th of July at, at um, Live at Five. No, not Live at Five. They came to our 4th of July uh, celebration um, over at the Empire Plaza, and they turned it out, of course. And then they came to the Egg. I saw them at the Egg. They did a Christmas show there. Uh, which is really nice. So the Temptations are still going strong. Of course, you know I have all their records. I bet you have all their records too, right? What's your favorite Temptations song? Think about it, and we're going to talk about it after the show. Now, 
we get to the most piece de resistance. Diana Ross, Florence Ballard, and Mary Wilson, three young ladies who lived in the Brewster housing projects in Detroit. They met each other as teens, and they said that in the, that area at that time, rock and roll was very popular. Everybody had a little singing group. So they formed their own little singing group. And, and their success story uh, doesn't start off right away. They signed with Motown right out of high school in 61. And they are known in Motown as the No Hit Supremes. They have something like eight records that are put out and none of them really chart until what happens is this. <clears throat> The story behind where did our love go? Put it all together, take it on the road. They didn't want to do it because it was given to the Marvelettes first. So originally they wanted Mary Wilson to do the lead, but then Barry Gordy said Diane was taking all leads. So that's how that happened. Diane didn't want to do the song because she felt it wasn't in the right key and she complained. But they said as they were doing it, she was angry and something in her voice changed so that she sounded like, baby, 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 don't believe me. Ooh, please don't. And then she stopped and ran and got Barry and said, ooh, they make me do this song. I don't want to do this song. I hate this song. And he said, let me hear it. And he said, this is going to be a hit. And she said, oh, God, we'll do it. So they did it. Got booked with the Dick Clark um, tour. And the reason they were put on the Dick Clark tour was because Mary Wells left. And they needed a, a fill-in act. And they were touring um, the South. And this is what's interesting. This is in 64. There were certain restaurants and places that they couldn't go into. And the bus had a bunch of rock and roll acts. Uh, Gene Pitney. Um, some other, uh, you know, rock and roll acts from the early 60s that were, that were popular. But some of them were, were, were African-American and some of them were white. Well, if they were in Philadelphia, they could all go to the same hotel restaurant. When they went to the South, it wasn't like that. So um, it, was, it was a situation they said where Diana Ross decided to go with all the other white kids to the restaurant. And then a few minutes later, they saw her running back. So can you imagine what would happen if you had that kind of success? And then uh, the, the, the very basic things in life are turned off to you. I often wonder, how these people survived that. Um, so let's let's get to the rest of the story. Well, on that tour, they were uh, the opening act. And so they would come on and do their two or three songs. And then they go to another city and do two or three songs. And this one, they started, I believe, in May on this tour. Uh, and so by the time they got to like the end of July, they would go on and they would do their song because they usually promote their new records like, um, when that love light shines in his eyes. And then they would do, baby, 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 don't you leave me. And they said the audience would just be, whoa, yeah, yeah. And this is how isolated people in show business can be. They didn't realize that their record was number one across the country. And once they found out, they were like jumping around, screaming and holler. And from that point on, uh, they would take it back to Motown and they were no longer on these tours. They were, they were going to be the group that was going to open the, 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 the doors for all the other groups. They were on the, every, every week they were on a different television show. They got to the Copacabana. They got to Las Vegas. They went to England. They were making top money, top of the line. They had these simple, uh, simple dresses on in the beginning, as you see. And then by the time they get to uh, two years later, they're wearing uh, Bob, Bob Mackie gowns <laughs> and with bugle beads that are hand sewn on that, that if you're one of them, you could buy a house with. So for me, I can remember vividly sitting in the living room um, with my family and my mother, grandmother's on the phone with my aunt in Philadelphia and they're talking about what the Supremes are wearing and is that a wig? You know how women are. And then um, they were on the, everybody in school the next day will be talking about, did you see the Supremes? And this is everybody, the, the, the black kids, the white kids, the teachers, the Supremes were very big. You don't get 12 number one records and be three little African-American girls from the pro housing projects in Detroit. Their success happened so fast and overwhelming at night that they were ready to do an interview for um, Look Magazine and their house, they had just been on the road for almost like a year straight. They let their housing, their dresses were still in the projects. 
So Motown had to basically buy them houses, which were, one was across the street from the other, one was down the street from it, 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 uh, the other. I actually know the name of the street was Buena, Buena Vista. And they were stars, so they couldn't walk down the street to the other person's house to get a party. A limousine had to come pick them up. They, and, and the stores were closed for them to go shopping. Everywhere they went, they were um, sold out. They made big money. They were on TV every week. Um, nobody else uh, um, was able to get like 12 straight number one records. I mean, the Supremes opened doors for a lot of, of, of people in general. And they made Motown um, the biggest thing that was happening. So, uh, yeah, I'm a Supremes fan. I've got an opportunity, we're going to get to this now, to see Diana Ross at um, Radio City Music Hall. And that was one of the best <laughs> uh, concerts I've ever been to in my life. Um, I got to see Mary Wilson. And I'm going to hold it up now. Can she see? Uh, Ver uh, hold up higher. A little bit lower. This is Mary Wilson uh, at Live at Five uh, when she came here to Albany. And somebody's supposed to say, why did she come to Albany? Well, the Albany Institute of History and Art had a um, exhibit. Mary Wilson collected all of those gowns because the Supremes actually owned those, their gowns. And she started an exhibit called the, um, the Mary Wilson Collection. And it traveled to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and to England and to California, around the country, around the world. And uh, she wrote a book about the Supremes in 1986, which became a bestseller called Dream Girls, My Life as a Supreme, where she tells some of the backstories. But the phenomenal thing that happened was I worked backstage at Alive at Five and um, she came to the museum and they got her to, to, to do a concert at Live at Five that June, I'll never forget it. And when I got there, I knew at some point I was gonna to try to meet her. And she was walking back to her trailer and she had um, chicken and salad and, and um, a, a water in her hand. And I said, uh, she said, get the door for me. I said, sure, sure, sure. So I got the door and she went in. And later when she came out all gussied up like this, <laughs> you, you couldn't believe it. She was always so pretty and beautiful. And afterwards, I have never seen anyone, the artist, be so humble. Everybody that came backstage, he had a meet and greet. And he would take pictures with them. Um, she would talk to them. She would sign autographs. And um, I was like, my goodness, this is great. And by the way, she was barefooted. <laughs> I thought that was cool. And afterwards, I, I said, OK, you need me to help you move this stuff back. And I introduced myself. And I showed her the articles that they had written about me um, bringing some stuff as part of the exhibit because I had a couple of their albums with pictures in it. So I had the articles and she said, I'd love to have these, give them to my secretary. So I said, sure. I didn't think anything else about it, nothing else about it until what happened? A month later, I got this big envelope from Nevada. I don't know nobody in Nevada. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. is not there anymore. And in it was a big poster of her, 2005 to Donald. Yeah, my name's Donald. And uh, signed Mary Wilson Touch. And she sent me two of them. One of them is prominently hanging in my hallway and will be there forever. And the other one uh, I donated uh, last summer to the Alibi restaurant in um, Schenectady. So it's hanging over there. Now, if we have, do we have the picture of the poster here? Yet, the poster. I don't. Okay, I sent you the slide, slide for the poster. If not, we'll see. Those are some of the pictures when they were making it in the big time, the link that, as you notice, that caricatures are really nice. I've seen that poster uh, in a record store in Times Square. It was going for like $1,000. I didn't have $1,000, not even in food stamps. This is a group. Uh, they went to London in 65. The British invasion came to America in 64. The Motown review went to Britain in um, 65. And as you'll see, um, to the left is Florence Ballard, Mary Wilson, and Diana Russell, the Supremes. And next to them is Martha and the Vandellas. 
in the background are the temptations, okay? And uh, some of the miracles. This is the whole group in London. And the guys in yellow are the temptations. As you see, that's the little guy on the floor is little Stevie Wonder. Next to him is Smokey Robinson, who's next to Diana Ross and the Supremes. And in the background, we have um, Martha and the Vandellas. And the guys in the red are the miracles, Smokey Robinson and the miracles. That's a nice picture. I love it. So Motown was known as the sound of young America. And as you see here, uh, in 1970, no, 1982, I believe, Barry Gordy sold Motown to, to Sony and for $66 million. And um, today, um, uh, we're, we're kind of saddened because we lost Mary, but in her time recently, she's been very active. She was on Dancing with the Stars. Um, more phenomenally, she campaigned very hard to get the Music Modernization Act passed because a lot, a lot of you know about Pandora and Spotify where people stream music. Well, pre-1972, they don't get any royalties on it. She campaigned along with Smokey Robinson and Dionne Warwick and a lot of other artists to make sure that people could get royalties from that. And, and the law did pass. So that's good. And um, she, she was an ambassador for UNICEF. A couple of other things. Uh, she represented the Supremes at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And um, she talked about the time when um, she had bought, the, met the Beatles at the um, in a hotel in Manhattan. The, the Supremes would meet the Beatles. They were, it was a battle. The Supremes would be number one, then the Beatles would get the number one record, then the Supremes would get number one. It was a battle. And they went to meet each other at the hotel and it didn't it work off because they came in their minks and their little hats and gloves and everything. And, and the Beatles were sitting around partying, hey, you know, strawberry fields, wherever. And years later, she talked to George Harrison, uh, who's Rolls Royce, she, Rolls Royce she bought from him. And he said that, when they were coming over, they expected to meet some hip black chicks and they came in the all prissy. I like saying the Supremes were always grand. They weren't gonna go out and hang out like that, but that was interesting. So those, those are some of the stories that I have. Now, with that in mind, let's turn it over to our um, audience out there and thank you all for being so attentive and listening to me uh, with my voice. I didn't have my tea and lemon today, but uh, I'm sure we have some, some stories. So let's carry on. Oh, oh, two, two seconds. Groups that were with Motown that went to other um, other labels, Gladys Knight and the Pips, uh, the Isley Brothers, the Spinners, and the Jackson Five left Motown and went to Columbia. And, and we know what happened with Michael Jackson, right? Yeah, okay. So yeah, a lot of the artists, uh, they kept, in the 70s, that's another story. A lot of the artists like Mo, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, that could write uh, um, um, albums and music, they were the main focus because the album had become more popular than the 45. So if you could do a concept album like Stevie or Smokey or Marvin could do, you were on your way. And they relocated, Motown relocated to Los Angeles, California. I remember being in Los Angeles and specifically on uh, Hollywood and Vine going to see the Motown um, Mo West Studios. Thank you. Questions? Okay, this is my question. I knew Roger was gonna be first. Forget the you know, other things. Who had the, uh, the three original Supremes? Who was the, your favorite singer? And I'm not talking about most emotive. Who do you think was the, technically the best singer? Are you asking me that? I'm asking you that. I, I like Ross. She was the lead singer, but that's that has uh, her voice basically was the one that was carrying those hits. Okay. Okay. But then I have a lot of other singers I like other than Diana Ross. I mean, I, I like, I like, I bought, I didn't buy like Diana Ross when she becomes solo. I bought the package. I bought the Supremes. When I heard "You Can't Hurry Love," I hear a symphony. I thought of them, you know, with her voice carrying it, and I still do. Next question, which one was your favorite? Me? 
Yes. Oh, Florence. I, I love buttered popcorn. To this day, I love buttered popcorn. Okay. All right. And they, <laughs> she they had a, a certain richness to her voice. And and while I got used to Diana's, I, I always yeah, I always thought that 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 Florence Florence was my favorite singer, and she got a very little time to actually do it, to perform it. Well, we we we're glad that we you gave us that that trivia because I know you're a Supremes fan. You give me all the the shimmy on them, and I know you have all their records too. Uh, anybody else have any more questions regarding the presentation? They're all shy out there. I know we had one from Holly um, who okay. asked during the presentation, she asked if, um, let me just make sure I say this correctly. Um, was there a central costume department or were the groups on their own uh, to produce concert wear? Okay. There wasn't a central costume per se, and from what, I understand, from what I understand, each individual group would have uh, people that would make clothes for them. They had a budget for that. But uh, groups like the Temptations or um, the Supremes, once they, they, they were decided what they wanted to wear, they sort of selected their own gowns. And they had people, they had people coming to them saying, we've got these gowns for you. You know, we'd like to sell them to you. So, um, that they didn't have. They had a grooming department, a choreography department, a music department. A, a, I should mention Barney Ailes, the marketing and public relations, was a genius to get these groups at a time during civil rights when the predominant amount of, of records that African Americans put out first went to uh, a, a, an African American station where most of these groups wanted to have um, margin, they, they wanted to play the big houses. I should have mentioned that during the time period when they started, you still have the Chitlin circuit. The Chitlin circuit is, is what's left over from segregation days. When these musical acts would travel to other cities, there were black hotels they stayed in, black restaurants they ate in. Does that make sense? And they had like the, if you saw the green book, that's what they had to follow, a green book. And in those, in, in, in those places like Baltimore or Chicago or LA or Philadelphia, in uh, New York, it was the Apollo Theater. In, in Baltimore, it was the, the, the Royal. In Philadelphia, it was the Uptown. In Chicago, it was the Regal, okay? So those were, those were places that you, you went on the Chitlin circuit. If you were a Motown act like the Supremes or Gladys Knight, and you had a hit and you went on the tour, you were gonna be hitting those places. And the, the, the Chitlin circuit had been established from the twenties when we talked about Ethel Waters and the blues guys where they, they didn't have a choice where they could stay. They had to stay in these segregated facilities. Um, an interesting book to read is Mary's book when she talks about them traveling in the South in 63 on the tour and um, getting shot at. And, and I think it was Alabama, or um, having to go in the woods to use the bathroom. And these are people who have hit records on the radio and they're on television, okay? And they, they talked a lot about how sad it was that the kids themselves didn't really care, but they could be somewhere like um, Virginia or North Carolina or Georgia, and they go to an auditorium and there'd be a rope down the middle with a black set to sit on one side, and the whites on one side, and a guy was standing there with a gun to make sure you didn't cross over. And the funny thing was, like in the Temptations movie, they showed that, and then they showed them going back to that same place, maybe uh, after Dr. King and, and uh, segregation ended, and everybody's dancing and partying together, which is what they wanted to do anyway, all right? But that Chitlin circuit was a reality for Motown groups in the, in the, the beginning until, like we say, Harry Pace Jr., and Black Swan comes along with the Harlem Renaissance, where Black people are trying to uplift themselves and change their image. And Motown comes along almost, oh, that's what I should say, simultaneously with the Civil Rights Movement. Before the march in Washington, uh, the Great Walk in, in, for Freedom in uh, Detroit happened in uh, June uh, in, in Detroit. And guess what? Guess who become, became a Motown artist? 
and recorded an album. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he has an album on Motown. They recorded his speech when he was there. So technically, if you look at a list of artists, and as I said, I gave you some of the main artists from the golden years, but in later years, people like Sammy Davis Jr., Bobby Darren, The Four Seasons, would sign with, with Motown because, because Motown had the, the way of getting into that top 40 and could revive your careers. You know what I'm saying? And uh, when they moved to Hollywood into the West, it changes the game because they can, they can survive for a while until disco becomes dominant on the charts. That's what everybody wants to hear. And after disco dies out in 70, about 76, then comes, no, 80, then comes hip hop. Motown today has a, a, a woman president. Her name's Ethiopia Hoffman. Her parents, her parents of Ethiopian descent, but she just specializes in hip hop groups. Motown, to, to trend and to stay with the times, um, you'll see their posters that will, will feature the older acts, but the newer acts, they begin very much getting into like uh, the hip hop scene. They realize that's where the money is. And people like Queen Latifah started Motown and Boys to Men. Okay, and then you get people that I don't care for, like Lil Wayne, you know. Um, it, the game's changing, and people that are in the business know how to, how to work that. But for me, the, the golden years with those groups, if I could still see them, I still go see them. Next question. What's your favorite Motown song or group? Hi, my hand is up. They didn't call on me, but I'm gonna, it's Marion. Oh, okay. how are you? So first of all, let me just say thank you so much for this. It's just been a, it's a wonderful time. And thank you also for the uh, Albany, of His, uh, Institute of His, to, Albany Institute of History and Art. This is really great way to spend the afternoon. So my favorite Motown song is, I'm going to say, I Heard It Through the Grapevine. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And yeah. What's, and, uh, and what's that? Go ahead. No, no, no. So just just a uh, um, background. I, in my house, really didn't grow up with a lot of um, this music. Another myth busted. But <laughs> um, I had a sister that you listened to a lot of it, and she kept a lot of the albums. I wish I could find them today. But yeah, that was my favorite um, song. And um, you, you mentioned that Stevie Wonder in the church, <laughs> those churches that made a lot of noise, uh, that was like Pentecostal church, which is what I grew up in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I am used to it. I am used to it from that perspective. Um, so, but I, I also wanted to say you asked us to take notes, and you said to um, write down "Down Home Blues" by Ethel Waters. So, are you going to tell? There's something particular you wanted to mention about that? Um, just that it sets off a um, a benchmark for the people that are in the recording industries, like the big bigger companies that didn't want to. Um, uh, hire black acts when they see that they can make a lot of money t targeting that that particular market they do but there's a there's a caveat mTOR they 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 label it race records and they market it towards a, a black audience in Chicago or LA or wherever if, if you go see this is why I have a problem with record stores you know you got this label this Country music over there and, and rock and rolls over there and hip hop's over here. It's music. And if you leave people alone, they'll decide what they want to hear. Okay? But you got to play it for them. Now, this is my what I have to say about what, the music thing and the labeling. Three of the biggest songs Gladys Knight and the Gladys Knight and the Pips had were Midnight Train to Georgia. Neither one of us, okay, and I believe the best that ever the best thing that ever happened to me. I had my share of life's ups and downs. Neither one of us wants to be the first to say. Neither one of us wants to be the first to say. Neither one of us wants to be the LA proved too much for the man. Okay. Everybody knows those songs. She won a lot of awards for them, um, and she puts them in all her shows. She did those songs at Proctor. She did Midnight Train to Georgia and Neither One of Us, Standing Ovation, all right? The gentleman who wrote those songs was from Mississippi. 
quarterback for Ole Miss and wrote those songs and they sold and Gladys got them. Three of her biggest songs. So they're not country songs. They're not R&B songs. They're music. And if you didn't tell people that, they wouldn't know. But I'm telling you because I feel that Motown success or any success has to do with talented people. And the more you analyze Motown, you see that the more people that were talented, rather got, regardless of their ethnicity, it was their talent that produced the greatness. Because after those songs were made and they would, they would bring in the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, go and listen to I Hear a Symphony or My Girl Today, some of you. And when you hear that, that, that uh, string section come in, it's the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, okay? Um, so let's, let's, not, let's, not, let's not kid ourselves. As talented people, I think Barry Gordy mentioned at one point that like maybe 65% of the people buying his, uh, his records were, all, were, all, were not African-American. So the market grew very much so, all right? And it, it, Motown changed the game in a big way because of people like the Supremes who, who, who went to the top, stayed at the top, and were vis visible on every television show you could think of. And so um, it kept the Motown name out there. Of course, you get people like the Jackson 5 that picks up another generation. You see, they were, they were savvy enough to know that think styles were changing again. And they had to pick up on that. So uh, the golden age is my age, and maybe that's why I'm into it. But um, I've seen a lot of those groups, and I've seen it perform, and, and it's, it's memorable. I, I come in my door every day, and Mary Wilson's poster is looking at me. And that's like, I touched an angel, all right? Uh, I, I will never be able to live that down. It, 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 it was a beautiful thing, all right? I'm, I'm about to cry. Let me stop. More questions? I'll just uh, read. So Barb Brinko said, uh, Donald, thanks for the great trip down memory lane. Heidi uh, said, thank you, Donald. She was not able to find the picture of Marjorie uh, in front of the show back in 1988, but she did meet her at an amazing tour of her family, Esther Gold Williams, who brought tears to her eyes, sharing the amazing place, helping with the charter school and the story of Little Stevie Wonder. Uh, Phil, uh, Phil said, thanks, Donald, great program. Uh, Gail, thank you, Donald. We toured Hitsville uh, years back, amazing place. Uh, so sad, uh, Jim Weatherly died. Yeah, the writer. The, the, writer, the writer of Neither One of Us and Midnight Train to Georgia and the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, Barb also said, I second that emotion. That, so that, that, where's Barb at? <laughs> Can we put Barb on the screen? And uh, Jeremy uh, Clove said, favorite Motown song, Superstition, um, one of the best songs ever recorded. Favorite Motown singer, David Ruffin, The Temptations, Incredible Emotion and Phrasing. Thank you for the great presentation. Look forward to learning more about Black Swan Records as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Gail, Tears of a Clown. Hi, Barb. And then Jim said here earlier you mentioned race records arising out of response to Black Swan. Was there a similar reaction to Motown, and how did Motown manage to outlast that? Oh, okay. I'm glad you asked. Um, yeah, I told you like when we when we had when I taught this course at um, St. Rose, we were comparing the similarities. Once Motown becomes um, tops in, in terms of the, the the top 40 mainstream because a lot of the Motown songs that were number one on an R&B chart excuse me, don't necessarily make it to number one on a um, a pop a, a, a top 40 chart. Marvin Gaye, I heard it through the grapevine did. I heard, uh, Reach Out, I'll Be the. I, I did the research on these, but we know these songs. And so what happens with, with Motown's impact is that larger companies, they don't jump on the bandwagon at first. In fact, if you go back to the Grammys, you see the Supremes and the Beatles in 64 or whatever are not getting Grammys. Now the Grammys is like um, a hip hop festival because they, you know, they realize they got the, the changing of the guard. But, but back to Motown, yes, the larger companies were beginning to realize that um, 
RCA and Columbia that they they that there was a mar- they weren't doing it because oh yeah we like soul music they were doing it because now they saw that there was a market for that and a lot of the easy listening um, artists that they had like Robert Goulet and Jerry Vale and Lena Horn they were popular with another group but the changing of the guard was happening pretty fast and if you look at the bottom line and the sales they saw where they could do something with that in the seventies. Um, let's let's put it this way. Only competition Motown had was from Stax Volt Records. Because where Motown was a little bit more refined and polished, Stax was Stax Volt was sold. Okay. They didn't pull any punches. Maybe next year I'll do the Stax Volt show. Um, they had the people like Sam and Dave and Otis Redding and Isaac Hayes and Carla Thomas. And that was phenomenal too. But they stuck closer to the blues and gospel roots. All right. Um, it was, it was, it was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty much if you listen to a black radio station in those days, that's where it was coming from the sound. You either got a Motown sound or you got a Memphis sound, but because of Motown's impact in the urban Northern cities, like Los Angeles and New York and and areas, um, record companies like Columbia realized that they could do something with it. So Philadelphia International in Philadelphia becomes what the, the next biggest competition to Motown. But remember, Motown is established and people like Stevie Wonder or Marvin Gaye or Jackson 5 or Supremes, wherever they go, they're gonna still have their following. They don't have to establish it anymore. I mean, they'd like to continue having hips, hits, like, but it, 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 the new groups like Teddy Pendergrass and um, the Three Degrees, you know, they're, they're like, a male group, a female group, of a female singer, a house band like MFSB that they have in Philadelphia. Yeah, there's a bigger company see that opportunity, but the game is changing in the sense that, um, remember when disco comes in, you use a lot less bands and you get starting to using a lot more technology because people want that dance beat. So the Donna Summers thing is happening for a while and that dominates when disco, uh, that was <laughs> those were my last good days with the platform shoes and the bell bottoms and the big hat. I was a chalk with Tony Monero, <laughs> and I hit all the clubs, you know, in Manhattan. That, I, that was what you did. But the sound was disco, and Motown had to adapt to that in order to to, to keep stay on the charts. So you get Diana Ross with Love Hangover, and and Marvin Gaye's Got to Give It Up, you know, types of songs and. And, and danceable songs, more so, uh, more so, uh, the Temptations with Papa was a Rose and so you know that disco beat. I remember going to a couple of parties in clubs, and all you heard was boom, 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 boom. boom. It was the third of September, my day I'll always remember. Yes, I will, cause that was the day that my. And then what they did was this. It used to be a three minute minimum. Now the songs could be 10 or 12, 12 minutes. So they would work work a groove on that with the musicians and the technology. So um, yes, they did, but more so Motown gets into the fabric of American uh, society and history because all of those, um, if you watch a TV show or a movie, there are, it's very, from the seventies, eighties and nineties, it's very hard that the movies and TV shows and commercials that are coming out are not gonna have a little bit of like the California Raisins, heard it through the grapevine, you know, uh, they borrow stuff all the time, you know, and it's been licensed, they can license to do that. But um, that's what I had to say about uh, the, the the impact of Motown. But Motown Motown's impact is is even, even more profound than, than Black Swan was even though Black Swan opens the doors to the majors, Motown, I think, takes the race record R&B out of the, out of the dimension. And, and people say, oh, this is good music. We want to go see Stevie Wonder and it sells out. We want to see Marvin Gaye. We want to see Gladys Knight and the Pips. Instead of it being, uh, you're going to be categorized and put into this corner with a sign on it that says race records, okay? Or rhythm and blues. All right. Does it make sense? Once we change that dynamic and let people 
stick what they like to hear, then it's fine. Next question. Um, Jeremy, the Funk Brothers came to Albany uh, to the Tulip Festival, and I got to meet some of the ones that survived. And you have to, when you talk about the Funk Brothers, that's another group of, of musicians that were black and white that made the hits. And when you look at the Funk Brothers, there's two sets of them. There's the set that starts with the um, uh, 63 with Jamie, Je uh, Benny Benjamin on the drums and James Jamerson, um, the bass band. And, and they played on a lot of, of the, the major hits that you get from, from Motown. And so then when they, when, when they either they're, they're dead or they pass away, they replace those guys with other musicians. And those musicians play on a lot of the big hits too. So some of the, when Earl Van Dyke, who was the musical director, and he would be compared to in Black Swan, Fletcher Henderson, they, these guys had a groove like you wouldn't believe. They took them, um, generally they, they didn't go on the road, they did the studio stuff. But when they went to England, they took them on the road. And they said, them brothers were so funky, they had to buy a whole new roof in London. They thought <laughs> they thought London Bridge was falling down <laughs> and the Funk Brothers did it. But there are um, Funk Brothers, they, they, they were careful, they say, not to um, let them, let, they didn't put their, uh, this is what I was told. One of the gentlemen said that they never put their names on the albums until Marvin Gaye's album. He wanted all the musicians on the What's Going On album listed. And one of the things they said that Motown was afraid that when other um, companies found out that these were the guys that had their sound, that they would try to rip them off, you know, or by, by uh, you know, outbidding them or whatever. But the guys at the, at the, at the Motown uh, the session musicians, they got paid by the day, but they got paid well. And, they said over there was like a Cadillac convention that um, you can't, that if you pass by West Grand Boulevard where they were during the day, that you see a red Cadillac, a green Cadillac, a gold Cadillac. And the guy was saying inside, they'd be arguing, I'm gonna get a new Cadillac, man. What color you gotta get green? No, you can't get green, I got green. So the money they were making was, was, was tremendous, you know, um, for that time period, but they were living large too, you know? So acknowledging them, as well as acknowledging Holland Dozier Holland for writing all those songs um, for all of those people like the Supremes and the Four Tops, uh, acknowledging Smokey Robinson for writing all those hits, acknowledging Norman Whitfield. And in the later years, um, before they go to California, they get Ashford and Simpson. And, and who do Ashford and Simpson write for? Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell. Ooh, baby. Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Ain't nothing like the, you're all I need to get by. Uh, ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough to keep me from you. Yeah, Ashford and Simpson, so. And how many heard of Meatloaf and Rick James? They tried to get into a rock thing. Meatloaf actually was a Motown act before he became Meatloaf. So was Rick James. Victoria, you're shaking your head. We're getting more? I just had uh, a few people who sort of emailed me after the fact, so they're not necessarily questions. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to let you know. Um, yeah, well. Rosemary Rosen just wanted to thank you so much for uh, this program, and she got a chance to meet Mary Wilson um, when we had the exhibit here. And it looks like Pamela also just wanted to say thank you for all of the memories. Um, Roger mentioned Super Freak. <laughs> Okay, very good. So are we winding down? 
I think so. All right. Do we have any last minute questions? Any comments on that? Otherwise, I want to just thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, and thank you, Donald, for your presentation. Uh, we'll give you a round of applause. So thank you for joining us today. Um, and we hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Please stay nice and warm. Uh, if you have any other thoughts or comments you'd like to share with us, please feel free to send them to Victoria. Everybody should have her email address and you can share them with Donald as well. Thank you all and uh, be safe. And listen to some Motown this week. I don't mean just other stuff. Listen to some classic Motown. Temptation Supreme, you can't go wrong, all right? Peace and chicken grease, I'm out of here. <laughs>